Hello, folks, and a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Thank you uh, for joining us here on uh, pretty much webinar week. Uh, you know, we had a very big release, uh, R1 2022, and, uh, you know, we are unpacking all the things uh, that were put in the release. Uh, so we have had, uh, you know, the Kinder Your webinars, the Teletic webinars, but today I'm actually very excited for our productivity webinar. This is where we can talk about all the things that, you know, our workflows demand uh, as developers or, you know, other roles where you need tools to be successful. And that's, you know, reporting, testing, uh, debugging, and unit testing and mocking. So that's what we're going to unpack today. So we are delighted to have you here. Um, and uh, I'm your host, Sam Basu. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And with me, I have uh, quite an entourage of uh, very smart folks today. So why don't we go through the list and maybe folks, you can introduce yourself, uh, starting with Rick. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Helwich. I'm a principal sales engineer here at Progress. I specialize in the reporting and .NET uh, frameworks, and I'm excited to be here. Lots of fun things to talk about. Yes, indeed. Peter. Hey, Sam. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Peter. I'm part of the sales engineering team at Progress, and uh, I happen to know a little bit of tech, a little bit of testing, automation, and stuff. And I'll be presenting test to you latest and greatest today. Very cool. And Eve. Hello, everyone. I'm Eve Terzillo. I'm a developer advocate. I work with Sam on our developer relations team, and I handle all things Fiddler. So I'm part of the debugging section of this today's webinar. All right. And Michelle. Hey, everybody. So, uh, my name is Mikhail Volov, and I am the engineering manager and at the same time the product manager for JustMock. Very cool. All right, folks. Uh, so uh, we have quite a team here, and we're going to unpack a lot of productivity, uh, you know, uh, tools and uh, frameworks for developers. While you see uh, just the five of us, we are standing on the shoulder of giants. Uh, all of our teams who put in uh, so much effort every release, and a lot of those folks are in the you know back rooms. Uh, so this is your chance to also ask away any questions. Uh, let's make use uh, of the time that you're spending here with us. So before we start, uh, just a couple of uh, you know housekeeping things uh, so if I can find my mouse there you go so we are here to talk about uh, all things developer productivity right everything in the developer cycle DevOps included how do we debug how do we troubleshoot and how do we report on things how do we test on things so that's what we are here to unpack um, now this is a slide that actually um, is for stuff that happened last week right uh, if you have not joined us and if you uh, do not know what we do uh, please consider uh, coming out and joining us uh, so all of last week uh, the release has actually been out for about 10 days now so all of last week we spent um, you know time digging into the release we brought on some engineers it was great interactive live streams and we have a lot of fun uh, and uh, again, if uh, if Twitch or any other news mediums are blocked on your you know work uh, you know, firewalls, we do record them all, and it's it's up on YouTube, so you can uh, you know come and uh, see what we are up to. And you know any other times, uh, not just release time, uh, we are uh, coded live on Twitch, so come and join us on the channel. We are streaming you know all through the week uh, on .NET, on JavaScript, on productivity. So uh, come and um, hang out with us whenever your time permits. All right, so uh, back to this week. And uh, kind of where we started was on Tuesday. That was all things JavaScript with all the Kinder UI folks talking about Angular, jQuery, React, and Vue. You can see actually some of this uh, come back today with uh, with reporting in particular. It's all one big uh, one big family. Yesterday it was uh, Ed uh, Charbonneau and myself, and we unpacked all things .NET. You know, there is so much love across web, uh, you know, mobile and desktop. So that was a lot of fun. And again, you can see uh, tie-ins to some of the desktop things uh, today as well. And this is today. This is all things productivity. If you are looking for an agenda, that's kind of what it is. We're going to talk about four things, reporting, test studio, fiddler, and just mock in that order. Uh, so probably about half an hour, uh, give or take for each one of them. So uh, we hope that you can uh, kind of uh, sit through and uh, take it all in as to what we can do for you uh, productivity wise. So. Uh, once again, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, if you are, uh, you know, if you have to run or if you have a meeting or if your connection has issues, don't worry. We are recording all of this in high def and we will put this out on YouTube as uh, quickly as we can. Now, uh, to the point of you making the most of your time, there is a Q&A panel um, in your webinar window. So please use that. 
Uh, we have folks, um, you know, we will try to answer some. We have folks in the back rooms who will try to answer your questions. But if you're on the social medias, uh, especially on Twitter, uh, use the hashtag HeyTillEric. So ask us any questions. We can get back to you. Maybe leave a breadcrumb trail. Uh, so please, uh, you know, feel free to ask any questions as we have. Now, uh, everything that we are talking about is part of the R1 2022 release. There are some uh, products, uh, especially like Testing and Fiddler, who kind of have free, uh, releases that are more frequent. Uh, same with like some of the you know mobile suites we talked about. Um, so overall, uh, everything kind of falls in this into this bucket. And if you want to know what's going on in the product that I care about or I'm using the most, uh, that's your one resource, blogs.tillary.com. Every team takes the time to write up exactly what's in the release. And uh, you know, many of you uh, have Tillary DevCraft and all of the stuff that we do, you have it as a bundle. Maybe you're not using some of this, uh, the tools that you have at your disposal, and maybe this webinar is a way for you to kind of start thinking like, oh, I can do this as a part of my testing or reporting or you know, debugging solutions. So um, please take a look at uh, our, our blog. And um, more importantly, all the bits that we're going to show you today for our R1 release, they have been out uh, for about a week, uh, 10 days now. So however you go get our bits, you know, go get them, right? Those are hot bits and um, be it through like the download section, be it through the control panel, be it through NuGet packages or NPM, uh, get the bits. And that's, that's how you're going to see the stuff that we're going to talk about today uh, light up uh, for your workflows. And, you know, we are uh, by developers, for developers. We genuinely care about your experiences. We do not want you to struggle. So please uh, tell us what you're seeing. If you have any issues, uh, give us support, uh, you know, questions. Docs is your best place to start. Uh, we try to put out a lot of demos so you can see firsthand how we are utilizing our stuff. We do dog food, a lot of our, uh, you know, technologies. And if you really have a burning desire to see something in a certain product that you don't see it yet, please tell us, uh, feedback.tillary.com. That's our one portal for all the things, right? Now, before we get started, um, we want to keep this a little interactive as well. So we do have a quick poll before we dive into any of the things for today. Uh, you know, developers and, you know, uh, uh, testers or uh, product managers, we all have different ways in, in which we learn about new technologies, right? So we want to know what are you doing? Uh, what is the thing that um, you know appeals to you the most? And again, there is no right or wrong. Those are actually multiple choice uh, answers now. So, uh, what is it that you are into these days? Is it videos? Is it documentation? Is it you know demos, code samples, uh, or forums? Uh, what is it that you learn uh, the most from? And this kind of applies to everything we do. We just want to kind of meet you where you are at. Um, make sure we are providing uh, content in a format that that uh, you like. All right, so going once, going twice, and done, done. Let's take a look at uh, where all of you are at. Oh, nice, okay. So kind of a split, uh, which is kind of what we expected anyways. Uh, uh, it's good to see a lot of video and, and demos uh, is what you like. So good to know, good to know. All right, uh, so with that, let's uh, let's move on and let's talk about uh, reporting. And I know Rick has been super excited to you know bring out all the things that the team has put together. But uh, Rick, I'm not uh, a big expert in reporting. Maybe you can walk me through a little bit, kind of help me understand where uh, where this fits. So I understand every enterprise workflow needs reporting. We have you know tons and tons of data. Uh, and without data visualization, like I, I'm going to be blind, like I won't see like the patterns or you know correlations in my data. Is that right? It's absolutely correct, Sam. There's we're living in a data-driven world. There's so much data out there. Making sense of it is critical to to any business, and being able to present that data in a easy to consume and easy to manage way is is paramount. Huge time saver. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I, uh, I mean, the benefits of reporting is just hard to uh, deny because everybody needs reporting. Every workflow needs reporting. So, uh, what can we do about it? So, we have uh, Telerik reporting. Which, uh, Rick, why don't I let you do like the elevator pitch? Because I know you, you're really good at this. <laughs> oh, thanks, Sam. Yeah. So, Telerik reporting is our uh, our .NET centric UI agnostic framework which creates scalable performance and in beautiful reports in your new or existing applications. So unpacking that just a bit, you know, on the on the back end on the service side, it's a it's a .NET library inherently. It runs on all the .NETs, the frameworks, the cores, the fives, the sixes, the the nexts. You know, we usually have zero day support for everything that comes out. 
But then on the front end, we have a huge collection of um, report viewers, which allow you to integrate it into any UI framework you're using, whether it be vanilla JavaScript all the way down to um, the latest and greatest uh, Win UI frameworks. Uh, we have a brand new React report viewer, which we're going to take a peek at a bit later. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I like uh, you know pulling this uh, list up of the things. Uh, hold on, if I can find my mouse again. So uh, this is kind of what I get with reporting, right? And I like the fact that you have like four strong pillars. Like first is how do I uh, you know get the data for my report and there is no dearth of like data sources we could you know fetch your data from right and then it's about like how do i build my report and um, we have multiple choices like do you want to do it straight up in your desktop as a standalone app do you want to do it inside of visual studio or uh, the thing that rick and me are uh, big fans of is the report designer web report designer that is entirely in your browser and it's a visit big uh, you know report generation and then it comes to visualizing the reports uh, which is what i think rick you talked about like uh, i see a lot of tech in here like i see pretty much all things web all things dot net um, so we can pretty much render our reports everywhere there's so much flexibility just baked into the package out of the box you know what you can do um, it can connect to anything, from anything, display anything anywhere. I, I have literally never come across a set of data that we have not been able to get into reporting because it is it's just set up in such a way to be to be flexible um, and allow the developer, you know, that ultimate level of control. And that's just out of the box for for the the more geeky out there. You know, it has a fully accessible API and extension points. So tag on and customize. You know, it's to your heart's content. Yeah, good to know. And then uh, the moment you start uh, generating reports, it's about how you export them out. Like, how do you deliver and serve it up to people? And, you know, there is no dearth of uh, things we can export it out to. So that is uh, reporting. But then uh, the crux of reporting is also like having all of the UI and, and all of the components that can render those reports. And it sounds like there is no dearth of that uh, either. Right. So there is a lot of UI help, you know, for getting your reports uh, up and running. And um, I keep hearing about Report Server here. Rick, uh, what is that? So Report Server is our application um, that we built, built in-house for people who needed reporting but didn't necessarily have a need to build their own application from scratch or didn't want to integrate reporting into an existing application. So if you need to do some reporting on, on your data but you don't want to build a custom application from scratch, this is just a simple install. It installs directly to Visual Studio, uh, and, excuse me, um, it's directly to IIS in under uh, under 10 minutes. You can do some quick setup and configuration and in under an hour be up and running on a, a fully scalable enterprise reporting solution, you know, ready to start start work. Yeah, so it sounds like like we are trying to uh, kind of cater to the pain of like the management. Like, how do I store my reports? How do I you know automate them? How do you schedule them? How do I deliver them? Uh, all of that in one uh, turnkey solution. All right, so that's kind of the overview. But uh, let's talk about uh, what is it that you are bringing new, you and the team uh, that's bringing new. I hear React is in. Uh, can I can I hear? You? Okay, yeah, Rick, you're you're still on. Um, so uh, sounds like a new report viewer is in in terms of uh, React for folks doing React applications, right? Absolutely. This was something that was um, hotly requested for for a while now. So the team sat down in the last release and we built a uh, brand new React viewer from scratch. Previously, you could have done this with just our regular um, JavaScript viewer, uh, but now we have one built just for React using you know those paradigms for your React JS developers out there. And I'm not a React guy. I can muddle my way through it. But I was able to set this thing up in you know five or ten minutes just by following the, oh, the nice. tutorial. So what you're saying is like it doesn't matter what the client is. Like I, I've seen like Blazor report viewers, I've seen Angular report viewers, or WPF report viewers. Like the reports, we can show them just about anywhere. Absolutely, because the the the, asymm um, the asymmetric and agnostic nature of reporting, the front end viewer is completely detached from the actual rendering engine. So it's right. just a utility that will make requests and receive um, input and display what what it gets back from the rendering engine. So that allows us quite a bit of flexibility for how to display our reports. Nice. All right. Now, um, the web report designer, this is something that is super nice because like we are doing stuff in the browser that it's meant for desktop, right? Pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so proud of what the team's able to achieve with the, the web report designer. This is something that has been requested for as long as I've been with the company. Um, previously, you know, report design was something you could only do 
in Visual Studio because you know you had to have that design surface. You know, then that was made you know exposed to external applications. Then we were able to build a custom you know platform based designer for it. But it was something you could only do on the platform um, because again the design surface was something that was it you is know, complex. Right? It's, it's yeah, just very, very desktopy hard. thing to do, right? And now we are replicating replicating all of that in a browser. Absolutely. The team built this from scratch. There was no out-of-box design surface that was available, so they just completely built the entire thing themselves. And yeah, now we can have the the experience of a web-based report design um, completely in the web, which it makes it very trivial to expose you know those report modification and creation features to your end users. So you don't have to ask them to install anything. There's no executables they have to accept. You know, there's no firewall policies that have to be opened up to let those downloads through. You just navigate to the web and use a very thin web client to you know begin work immediately. Right. All right. So uh, what's new here? I, I uh, see report books and I see visual snap lines. As so as we've built this feature, the the web report designer, we've been moving ever closer towards feature parity with the the desktop. So every release, we're adding new new things. I mean, for a long time now, you've all you've been able to do everything in the web designer that you could have done in the standalone designer, uh, the platform designer. But uh, now we're just making it just as easy, just as um, productive with extra wizards, um, extra alignment tools. So one, a couple of new things that we added were the built-in ability to um, work with report books in a visual way. So a report book is basically a, a report of reports. So think of it as like a chapter book, chapter being a different report, including you know a table of contents. I have a nice demo of this one. Yeah, but, okay. um, and they you know, snap lines, because you know, when you're laying things out in a report, sometimes it may not be apparent that your your text box is you know one or two pixels left or right of the other one. Mm -hmm. But when you render that report and now there's 50 rows, it's going to be very apparent that one right. of them is on yeah. the other. Yeah, so, alignment is key. And and again, these are the kind of very desktopy things that we are now able to uh, bring to the web, which is amazing. All right, so uh, moving forward um, here, so uh, looks like there's a brand new reports assets manager. What is that? This one is so cool. So um, previous to, to coming out with this, if you had a report that you were uploading to the web and it had, let's say, an image in it, a logo for your company, the way that had to be handled was that image would be serialized to its you know, base64 version and embedded directly in the report. You can imagine if you have a very re image-heavy report, eventually that's going to increase the size of that reporting file. So now you have mm -hmm. a larger file to manage and move around. Also, those assets become um, embedded uh, in the report. They now live on an island in that report. So if your company changes its logo, uh, you have to go into all 500 reports and change that logo there. Um, right. So what the asset manager did is it provides a online repository and catalog of commonly used assets, whether those be images, style sheets, other resources, anything can be serialized. And you can reference that directly from your asset manager. So that gives you the ability to say swap an image in the um, the asset manager and have that image automatically applied to every report that's using it. So imagine just uploading a new logo and automatically having that logo be in 500 reports, you know, in the header, without yeah. having to make yeah. any changes at all to any of those reports. Yeah, and then to the last point here, I, I can actually see how this is super beneficial if you're using the report server because then it's all in one uh, one, and you can reuse like your you know design system assets and your shared uh, you know imagery all across uh, the company, not just like one set of reports. And it's like like you said, like it's you need to update something, you just do it once, and it just trickles down to every report. It's really in the report server where this shines because developers yeah. always had ways to get these things done. You know, we could use you know remote web um, remote web resources and configuration right. uh, scripts and things. Uh, well, this makes it, it really available to anybody. Yeah. All right. You know, uh, enough talking. I actually want to see uh, some of this. Oh, and it looks like there's more. There's uh, Visual Studio integration. You know, uh, you got uh, brand new VS item templates that now know how to pull in you know NuGet packages if you're doing uh, WPF. Uh, style, uh, you know, viewers or maybe even other viewers. And uh, I see something that kind of squarely um, uh, relates to me as a .NET developer. You got .NET 6 support and you are supporting minimal APIs, which is kind of a lightweight way of kind of spinning up APIs, uh, especially for the REST services uh, part of your reporting, right? 
Yes, and that's that's very cool, particularly because there's nothing that you know us as developers really have to do in order to take advantage of this. If your application is using minimal APIs, the automatic configuration that's built into reporting um, with the Visual Studio extensions will detect that. It's it will detect that that's enabled in your um, solution, and will automatically configure your microservices to use minimal APIs. So there's no nice. separate work that you have to do. It's just kind of a, a nice added value. Nice. All right. Let's let's see it. If you are ready, uh, Rick, I'm going to um, give you the uh, screen here. Sure thing. Uh, so Let let's me... uh, let's find you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Thank you, Sam. All right. Yep. We see it. Okay. You should be seeing uh, my report server. Yes. Okay, perfect. So yeah, usually when um, we do a demo like this, I try and find something fun to do. Usually people are reporting on stocks and you know things like that. So I thought for this time we would do some reporting with uh, with bonds instead of stocks. So you know, everyone does you know stock reporting. What what, so, uh, what type of bonds are you talking about? Well, I mean, there's really only one type of bond out there that you would <laughs> want to build a report around, um, and that is you know naturally. Uh, Games bond. Uh, I, I love this how you make you know reporting uh, on really like fun data sets. I well, I that. wanted to. I was talking to it might have even been you, Sam, but someone about all the James Bond movies, and I, I was just saying there must be a data set out there that has mm -hmm. all of the James Bond movies in a collection because I certainly can't remember all of them. So I did a little digging. I found an online um, database that had a nice accessible API, you know, easy to tie into with our our web. Um, data source. Um, and from there, it was really simple. They just get a list of all of the James Bond movies and and connect, connect it out. And as I started building this, it became very apparent that there was um, a lot of data and a lot of repeatability. So, you know, this was a good example of building sort of a templated style report. So what's going on here is this is this report just finding all the movies, but embedded in here is a second report, a sub report. And that's the actual movie template which we're seeing. So each one of these is a, its own um, template. So they can be managed, you know, quite separately, um, but connecting to similar data. And that kind of lets you, you know, build things in a piecewise and easy to maintain way. Um, and of course, once I got this built, Sam came to me and said, you know, I'm really interested in seeing, you know, what cars James Bond would use in his different movies. So that was a bit um, of a challenge, Sam, as you remember, because that was not in our data set at all. So, so what did you do? You you went out and you you built me my own uh, yeah. service for this. Yeah, a, a little API that can uh, kind of pull up uh, all of the fancy Bond cars, because yeah, you know that's fun. Uh, but uh, before I do that, uh, this is something you're running locally, and is this um, is this a, a Blazor report viewer, or are we looking at React? So right now we are just in the Telerik report server. Um, so this okay. is um, everything that you see here is just delivered in the Telerik report server, and this is my sort of management studio for working with these things. It it makes it super simple to to maintain and manage your, your reports. I mean, you you can see here I was fiddling with one of my reports uh, last night, and I managed to break it and could not figure out what the heck I did to it. So a cool thing that report server does, which is you know a nice value add, is you can revert to a previous version. So I just went back down my list. I found one that was working and I reverted back to it, which was revision three here. Uh, so it, it, there's a lot of nice little um, features that are built into this completed application that, you know, as a developer, you have to build yourself. Um, okay. But we are going to take a look at the uh, React report viewer um, in a second. Okay. So, so did you want me to show the API real quick? Uh, yeah, if you want to, if you want to show the API. Actually, well, you don't have to switch screens, actually. That's a bit of a hassle. Uh, leave it to say that you built me a nice, you know, API that I was able to tie into. So I added this nice little icon here to my template. So you click on the car icon and it loads up a different report. It's taking a parameter from the um, from that first report, which is the uh, name or ID of the movie. Cross references that with Sam's web API and was able to find each car that was used in each movie. So you can go through you know, the various Bond movies and see the different cars that are used. I think one of the most interesting ones was I never knew that they used um, a little, uh, what, what do you call these, Sam? Uh, uh, like a, it's a it's an auto rickshaw. Uh, yeah, or, it's, you it's know, there are a like few, a few ways of calling it. And uh, this is commonly used in Asia. 
So I, I need to go back and watch this movie now because I had no idea and I want to see how this is actually used in the movie. So using the, I'm going to get rid of my preview, go back to the main reports page. So like I said, because you know this is a very template built um, engine in, in reporting, using that I was able to spin up a couple different movie collections um, using the exact same template. And all I really did is I passed in a different parameter to my um, to my API call and everything automatically changed from different movie collections. So I have one for Star Wars and, and Star Trek. But these are all separate reports. So how do you visualize separate reports you know, at the same time? We talked about it a second ago. That's a report book. So I made a movies collection. Um, and this would be a great way if you wanted to have you know, some way to keep track of your movies in your library or any way to visualize you know, uh, this, this, um, this data. So once this, this is going through right now, it's loading all of those reports on the back end. It's looking at all of them and how long they are and compiling a Oh, um, nice. on the main table of contents. Oh, look at so, that. I like the table of contents there. Yes. And this here is based on the, the web view, which kind of has, you know, infinite size. So these uh, these page numbers here, you know, don't have a super meaningful um, because each uh, report is one logical page. Uh, there's no, you know, length, maximum length that you have in a web view. But if we go over to a sort of a print preview, like I mentioned before, everything in reporting, you know, is kind of fixed around a, a page, you know, the idea of a page. So in a print preview, um, this is what it would look like to print this on an eight and a half by 11, you know, standard A4 size format, one inch margins. You would get a, you know, cover page with your table of contents, the actual page numbers of where the different sections start. And then you have um, all the different collections available you know, on those pages. Now, if you're using a format like PDF that has um, bookmarks you know, built in as part of the framework, this clickability for these different sections maintains, um, yeah. remains, remains available. So nice. you can generate a PDF and just navigate around it sort of using these different sections. And that makes it really super simple to export to different formats. There's um, you know, 17 plus rendering extensions for reporting and all of them look exactly the same. They have that same layout. And that ends up being, you know, super useful because reporting isn't just used for, you know, uh, movie collections or business data. It's used for absolutely everything. So I've seen it. You can use it to generate invoices, you know, um, and those have to be printed mm -hmm. onto a fixed page size. It can be used for packing slips. You know, those can be any size in the format. It's even I've seen it used for shipping labels and even um, receipts. So you can set the paper size to be continuous, a narrow paper um, size with no margin, and print um, receipts out of a thermal printer. You know, using using reporting. So super super flexible. So it sounded like uh, you know some of the images that you are using uh, like came from the assets manager. Like uh, the little icon of the car was repeated. It is. So let's take a look at that real quick. So what I want to do here is remember how I mentioned that we had a sub report which we're using for our movies. So I'm gonna open this, and I'm gonna open it in the web-based report designer. So this is you know, baked into the report server. So I can open that quite simply, and we have, this is just that movie template that we were looking at, mm -hmm. that one field. So this is, gets reused and everything. But here's that, um, here's that image that we were looking at that we used for the car. So this is based off of an image that is in my asset manager. So I open the asset manager, navigate to resources and images, and here is my car icon. So let's say, you know, I have this in 10 reports, 100 reports, 1,000 reports, and I want to change it. Well, I can either go into all 1,000 reports and change it explicitly, or I can come into here, I can delete this, um, this asset and upload a new one. Let's see, up there, you know, upload and browse. And you know, James Bond has fancy cars, so let's give him a red car icon. We'll hit upload. Oh, there we go. And return. And I think if I refresh this, it should show. There we go. Mm, nice. So yeah. That uh, is automatically replaced in, in all the reports. So we can go back in and we just load up our bond report again and our, our cars should have um we should have red cars now in our in our report nice now do you want to show the um the react uh viewer real quick 
I am. I am. Okay. So like I said, I'm not a React guy, but I was able to set this up in about five, 10 minutes. It was super simple. I did a create rack, create React app command. They create the basic React app. Um, then I ran uh, an NPM install for the one package that we need for progress, added um, an import here and some uh, style information in the HTML page. And then I just honestly copy and pasted the, you know, the, the object uh, declaration and initialization code from our documentation. And I let the you know the more experienced React guys do that part for me. Uh, I came in and I just told it to look to my report server, um, which is my reports repository and rendering engine. And I told it which report I wanted to load for me. And that's going to be our our movie collection report in TRTP. So from there, you just do a npm start, and uh, this is usually pretty pretty quick to launch. So once it um, does the you know, compilation, launches the web server, loads the app. Okay, so our our report viewer is now fully loaded and rendered. And what it's doing on the back end is making that asynchronous request back to my report server for that report. That report is being generated, rendered, inflated, data bound, and then it should be streaming back to this on the front end, completely separate you know, components. They're not connected in any way. Um, mm -hmm. And it even has my red car icon. Yeah, I'm impressed. You're, you're a React developer now. <laughs> oh. oh, that's all it takes. Very cool. All right, uh, Rick, anything more you want to showcase? Uh, you want to talk about? We talked about the asset manager, the snap lines, the report books, the minimal APIs, and the templates. Those are my those are my bullet points. I mean, okay. I just quickly, I can move something around. And I don't know if you can see, but you can see the I alignment. Love the snap lines. Yeah, that is so key, you know, when you're designing reports. I am not a designer by any stretch of the imagination, but this makes it look like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right, um, and I know uh, folks are asking questions. Uh, our teams uh, in the back rooms, they are, you know, uh, they're the folks who build this stuff. So please uh, keep uh, you know, asking away questions here. So Rick, if I can uh, maybe uh, steal the screen back from you, um, Absolutely. I could uh, I could quickly mention something uh, because I know uh, Eve has been uh, patiently waiting, and uh, we haven't talked about Fiddler yet, but I just want to quickly touch upon like what it is. And, and how nice uh, this is. Um, so since we are talking bond uh, cars, uh, so this is the thing that you know um, uh, Rick is using. Uh, uh, this is the thing we built actually last week on stream. Uh, so uh, it is a very simple, uh, you know, minimal API. This is running on .NET 6, and this has got nothing to do with reporting uh, per se. But just wanted to show you like how simple it is. Uh, if you look at uh, the CS proj uh, in my project, it is just literally as simple as .NET 6, and we are uh, enabling, uh, you know implicit um, uh, using. So there is a global using, uh, but it's all in my object directory. Uh, and all it takes is just enabling it. And this is what uh, you know we were able to uh, do with uh, Rick's movie uh, interfaces. Uh, minimal APIs, this is all it needs, like three lines of code. Uh, we have a builder. Uh, the map get essentially throws hello world, but we have one more endpoint here that throws all the bond cars, which is a fancy bond car, is essentially uh, a record. And then we say app.run. Uh, and so this is exactly what we have running. Uh, so just so you know, I can do a .NET run. And I can, uh, you know, pull up uh, this little minimal API. And if you're using a minimal API like this for, you know, the REST service that your reporting server needs, we will figure it out, and we will, uh, you know, give you some of the things uh, configuration-wise that uh, the reporting server needs. Uh, so let's go to, uh, you know, five one one nine. That's that's my hello world, right? And then if I go to uh, bond cars, right? I get uh, my JSON back, which is just li literally just like hard coded. But this looks a little, you know, uh, clunky. Uh, what I would like to do is maybe if I'm building up this API for uh, for Rick or any any other uh, client of mine, be it mobile, desktop, uh, I, I want to have a nice interface. So this is where Fiddler everywhere really helps me out, right? Uh, and I'm on a Mac. I can do this on Windows as well. And um, I, I don't want to steal, you know, uh, use Thunder here, but this is the whole new getting started experience, which is beautiful. Um, so we're going to, uh, you know, come back to that. But here's my API composer. Uh, so in here, I can uh, quickly grab my, you know, endpoint, and uh, I can I can go in there and I can execute this. Uh, HTTP one is fine, and now I get a nicer, you know, look at my API. You know, it's nicely formatted JSON. I can, you know, tinker with all of the, you know, uh, any cookies, any headers, any, you know 
authorization authentication things I have uh, I have going on. So it's just really nice. And then uh, once I was done with that, uh, it was just like one click. Um, uh, if I go back here to my Visual Studio, uh, I did a .NET publish and then a right click to Azure. And uh, you know that's the, that's the service that's been running. So I think it uh, the same service is up on Bond Cars or Azure websites. So this is exactly what uh, you know Rick was using, and it uses the same like movie ID. So that's why it's able to you know make the link and uh, pull up the report. So uh, you know just a quick little example of you know, using a completely different API. Uh, from your .NET, you know, ecosystem where you're building your reports and being able to reference that real quick. All right, so I know we have a lot of content uh, waiting, so let's actually uh, switch gears. Uh, and before we do, uh, we do actually have a quick poll. Now that we have talked about, you know, all things reporting-wise, you know, you see what we can do. Um, let's talk about uh, the report designer a little bit. Um, what is it that, uh, you know, um, that you like to use to design your reports. And Rick kind of talked about a few options here. You have the standalone designer, which, I mean, we didn't get a chance to show it, but it's it's a full-on uh, desktop uh, app that lets you design your reports to your heart's content. You obviously have it inside of Visual Studio if you want, uh, but the web report designer, uh, so, I mean, Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, like it's pretty much at feature parity with, uh, with the desktop versions, right? Absolutely, you can do everything in the web report designer that you can do in the standalone designer. What we're adding now are, just things to make some of those tasks easier, like uh, like wizards and built-in expression generating engines. But you could always, you know, type the expression, you know. Uh, so absolute feature parity. Yeah, love that. All right, folks. Uh, so tell us uh, how you like uh, designing your reports, and you know, we will try to you know play to uh, what you are doing. So going once, going twice, and let's see your responses. All right, mix back. Um, a lot of folks uh, still do like your, your standalone or uh, Visual Studio ones. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, Rick, look at that. Web report designers up to like 43%. So we are really happy to see. And again, the team has put in so much of you know uh, 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 blood and sweat into this uh, to make web report designing uh, a legit option for you. And this is great for you know end users where you don't have to install anything. You're just giving them rights to uh, tinker with reporting. So that's that's great to know. Yeah, it's, right. getting, it's getting super seamless too between those two tools. If we have more time at some point uh, in the future, Sam, I'd love to sit down and show how you can use both of them together in the same report to as a team yeah. you know, work, work on a report. Yeah, absolutely. And and I've uh, I've looked at documentation for you know for developers to throw up that web report designer, just a couple of lines of code, and it starts working in your ASP.NET application. So that's amazing. All right, all right. Uh, so Rick and you know uh, the team backing you up. Uh, thank you so much for all things uh, reporting. Let's talk about testing. All right, Peter. I hope you're ready because uh, I'm Absolutely. ready to learn. I'm ready to learn. Uh, you know uh, the whole testing DevOps. This is coming closer and closer. It's a tighter loop for developers. Uh, so uh, tell me what I'm missing here. So first up, we're talking about automated testing here, right? Yep, sure. Uh, thanks, Sam, and uh, thanks, by the way, Rick, an amazing uh, demo and presentation. Um, going back to the entire testing process, yeah, automation in general, not only testing automation, is becoming an essential part of our day-to-day -day, uh, jobs and lives as devs or, uh, or QAs, right? I'm a little bit of the both worlds here. That's why I'm uh, um, talking like that. Um, so, no, it's been around uh, here. There is a lot of manual processing, starting from the building of the application to the deployment and delivery and to the test but as long as we scale if we want to scale we need to implement automation in way in one way or another again starting from the builds starting from the deployments and going to the automation tests the more you the more you scale the more repetitive tasks you have uh, the more uh, prone to errors you are and i can talk from experience yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, okay, so going uh, forward, um, I, I keep hearing you and the team talking about, you know, agile DevOps, like how this is all like one circle and we all need to be a part of it. Can you talk to this uh, a little bit more? Uh, this is a real life story, by the way. I remember a lot of years ago, we were sitting on the table and all of a sudden we decided that it's going to be the agile DevOps uh, table from where on we are going to move uh, forward, a real story. Uh, I'm not joking, and um, that's why I'd like and we'd like to, to market and present this to you like that, that with it, with its solution, everybody has a seat on uh, the Agile DevOps. Why is that? Uh, we already discussed uh, DevOps um, 
in general, agile or fragile. No need to no need to to introduce and talk about that right now. But Test Studio as a solution provides uh, benefits for your entire team and starting from the QAs uh, themselves, which the, the the tool helps and targets. But apart from that, Test Studio also lives in uh, your favorite IDs like uh, Visual Studio, for example. It exists as a plugin, which means that it enhances collaboration between the dev team and the QA team, starting that, you know, the developers, they don't like to switch context. Uh, they want to stay in their favorite environment and don't be distracted or bothered with everything else. And so having this um, plugin, the dev edition of uh, Test2, you can very easily collaborate and help uh, the QAs uh, either, either by writing some helper files or just tweaking a little bit the tests uh, from code, you know, from the code so that the work becomes a little bit more easier, uh, you know. And um, we don't finish uh, here. We have uh, our favorite project managers, which are always eager to know where we are and how the project is going and are the, did the tests finish and when we're going to release because the customer right. is uh, <laughs> waiting and asking uh, for that. Um, there is an entire session of Test Studio, the so-called executive dashboard, and I hope we have uh, some time remaining so I can just show it for, uh, for a minute or so, okay. where you can track the entire progress and health of your project by means of showing all the test lists uh, Execution. Yeah, like a man managerial view. So let, let's let's actually get to it. Uh, but I do have a couple more questions. And I mean, when yeah. you talk about testing, you are talking about things in a CI CD pipeline most of the time, like continuously delivering value, right? So you're talking about the entire cycle uh, of how we, you know, write code and how we are, you know, uh, automating the tests, and then then how is QA running it? How is it coming back to the developers? Like the whole thing, and then the executor dashboard kind of gives you an overall view of the whole thing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. uh, the entire process of the CI, uh, CD, CD, whatever they, they want to, to call it uh, nowadays, gives you, uh, it's not a webinar about CI, CD, but it's very important to underline it because it's the big picture, right? Without yeah, understanding the big picture, it's very difficult to explain why we introduced such features as of um, the ones that I'm going to show you a little bit later uh, during the demo. So the entire CI, CD process allows you uh, brings tra transparency of the entire process and um, it's much easier to see who has done what, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to do some auditions or stuff, um, it's very easy to get along uh, with that. And also the repetitive tasks are virtually cleaned of any errors. I myself, by the way, a real story again from wife, you know, I park my car in a very tiny garage and I have to do a lot of maneuvers every day, twice or three times a day, and I can do it with my eyes closed, right? But it doesn't prevent me from scratching my handle, what I oh. did like two weeks ago, because it's a repetitive task. And sooner or later, if you do it manually, you're prone to errors. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I don't have someone to park my car. I had to do it myself. But okay. it doesn't matter how you, you good you are, the human brain tends to be bored if there is some repetitive yeah. task. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Running those automation tests whenever your pipeline is triggered will make sure that you have a clean, free of bugs build at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, makes sense. All right, so uh, what type of apps are we talking about? Like you gave me a slide here, which really talks about every type of web app. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Test Studio is an end-to-end -end solution for UI automation of any web interface that can exist there. Yeah, so Starting from the old school, yeah, even SuperWhite is uh, still there. Uh, getting to the latest and the greatest, like uh, Blazor, React, Angular, yeah. and, uh, and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're covering pretty much all things web, you know, web forms, jQuery, uh, pure HTML, Absolutely. Blazor, React, Angular, that's awesome. And, and to uh, the point here, like, if uh, somebody is using, uh, you know, Telerik bits, uh, you know, be it for web or be it for, you know, uh, I, I see uh, WPF, which is something I've spent a lot of time in, uh, that's nice to hear that you can actually, you know, cater and customize a lot to that UI. Yep, uh, desktop applications are included uh, as long as it is a WPF tech uh, on the UI, it doesn't matter if um, on .NET Core or not. And I'm not saying anything, I'm just opening the door a little bit, but more on the desktop side automation is uh, coming. Okay. So all right, we'll keep an eye out. Updates, uh, yeah. 
All right. Now, I do have some questions going in, though, um, about, you know, containers testing. And I see that uh, this is one of the big things uh, in the latest, you know, Test Studio releases. You got functional testing that now has container support. Uh, you got headless automated testing uh, in, in Docker, which is, again, a type of container. And .NET 6 support, I love that, you know, for WPF. So yeah. uh, I, I want to ask you a few more questions here. And uh, uh, tell me a little bit more about like wh what why does this matter? What, why is it that we should test in containers? Yeah, you know, one of the most asked uh, questions. And again, let me just go back a little bit for the bigger picture to say starting with the headless execution because with the introduction of the container testing feature that we have now with the latest uh, version of uh, Test Studio, we allow you to run those tests within the containers in a headless mode. And you know the headless mode takes care of not showing the browser. So you don't see it while the test runs, which means that the speed of execution itself drastically increases. Uh, benchmarking, I cannot say, but from personal experience, I can tell you that it's around three to five times quicker to have a mm -hmm. test run in headless mode because you don't see the browser, don't wait for the browser to, to open and that kind of uh, stuff, everything happens on the backend and that is pushed into the container. And why is this container? Remember about the CI CD processing that we were uh, discussing. Setting up infrastructure is quite tedious uh, work. And again, you might be prone to errors. As an application developer, for sure, I would uh, want to, to be clear that my application uh, runs on different environments, on different setups, on different operating systems, on different browsers, and whatnot. And if I want to run my tests on them, I have to Eitherly, man, either manually go and set up all of these environments, maintain them, which takes a lot of time and effort, you know, and this is, what, uh, this is not what automation wants you to do. Mm -hmm. Or I can use the beautiful magic of virtual machines or even better, the beautiful magic of the containers, right, which take care of all of this setup and maintenance and infrastructuring as long as you put everything within these uh, containers and then just a piece of configuration to run it successfully. Yeah. And I also like the fact that the, the isolation point, like you're, you're clearing your table of any other factors that might, you know, uh, influence your testing. And yep. uh, chat room's been uh, asking questions. Uh, Bob is asking about like other, you know, desktop uh, platforms. So uh, to Peter's point, let's keep an eye out. Uh, there might be things Just here. Just opening the doors, guys. Very yeah, soon right. we'll be able to provide more, more information about that. All right. So now why Test Studio with, with Docker? What, what do I get by running my Test Studio uh, tests in, in Docker? Okay. Uh, so as far as feature requests and stuff, we do take seriously. This is not a sales or marketing pitch at the moment. We do take seriously our customers' uh, requests and feedback. So honestly, uh, introduction of uh, kind of a Docker integration was one of the most requested uh, feature for quite some time. So straight to your question, that's why we decided to go with Docker yeah. initially. All right. Also, you know, Docker lives um, eh, very comfortably within the DevOps, Azure DevOps uh, environment. And by the way, Test Studio offers full integration with any CI CD server that exists uh, out there. Including, of course, um, Azure DevOps, which is one of the most popular. Yeah, and uh, I, have, uh, I have the next slide pretty much talking about, you know, uh, yeah. all of these CI/CD pipelines and Azure pipelines. So it all kind of plays in together, right? So you 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 can host things uh, in Azure or run your tests in Docker, either in the cloud or you know by yourself on premises. So uh, it's a lot of options to really scale you know, how you run your tests, right? We're all sitting on the Azure, Azure on the Agile DevOps, uh, DevOps sorry, and uh, behind us is the execution buffet, where you can choose mm. whatever type of execution and environment uh, you want. So you can use our own scheduling and storaging services and servers, which Test Studio provide you out of the box and set up, set uh, them up in an environment of your choice, or you can choose from the buffet and kind of integration with the CI/CD servers that exists uh, out there name it, I don't want um, to mention all of them, but whatever exists out there, we can hook uh, into that. Uh, and of course, another option is using those uh, containers in separate isolated environments of, uh, of your choice, or even combine them in one. Yeah, one makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I'm enticed, I, I want to go eat at your buffet, so why don't you show me a little <laughs> bit more, <laughs> more stuff here? Definitely, so let me. I'm going to yeah. make you the presenter. Uh, if I can find yeah. your name, 
there. Now you should be free to uh, share your screen and show us stuff. Just give me a second because too many machines and monitors here, but you guys should be able to see Test Studio interface at the moment. We do, we do. Right. Uh, so Test Studio as a tool is a so-called, uh, just a quick intro here, it's a so-called point and click recorder, meaning that you mimic uh, the end user behavior by navigating through your application. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how a test script is created. It doesn't mean, however, that uh, if you feel comfortable using your coding uh, skills, that you cannot uh, create some additional coded steps and uh, scenarios uh, there. It is also possible as long as you feel comfortable with uh, C Sharp or VB.net. And this is a quick example that I have uh, created for you. You know, we are talking about agents. We were talking about fancy cars and gadgets before. So somehow naturally, uh, I created a test uh, that searches for one of the popular agents uh, out there, 007 agent. And um, it, uh, let me just show it to you. By the way, this test is a mix of the point and click recording and the code steps that we were uh, discussing. I quickly uh, created some randomly gener random generator of a few double seven movies out this, this is there. this is all uh, Rick's fault for getting us on the James Bond train. Like we are talking about uh, deploying agents here. This is getting fun. Yeah, we're on the same team, so we're no, all agents uh, today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm randomly generating some cool highly scored uh, James Bond uh, movies. And I'm going to one of the most popular sites. Uh, I'm navigating to one of the most popular sites out there in order to search for those movies, right? Which this step does, and this step actually is fed by the randomly generated um, variable, which is the title of the movie. Uh, then I'm selecting this movie and I'm checking its score and here by some fancy regex and uh, I just love regex. Uh, I know that it can be a pain sometimes, but you can totally avoid this and uh, do it yourself without it, just from the interface. I'm checking if the overall score of this um, 007 movie is above seven, right? And then I'm writing all of these to the walk. So as we discussed, there are multiple ways to run this this test, this test uh, at the moment, using the test lists within Test Studio or pushing them to Azure DevOps or to Docker. However, the greatest star of the evening today, evening my time Ooh, in Europe, look at that. Uh, Docker. is uh, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Docker here. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, in advance, I have um, installed uh, an image here and set up um, everything so that we don't um, we don't waste time during uh, during the demo, uh, but all you need to do after this is set up, and believe me, it's relatively easy uh, uh, to do it. You need to put the browser, because we support headless execution with uh, Chrome at the moment. So you need to put the Chrome installer and the test of your project within the container. In the ideal case, of course, in the full CI CD automation process, you can put your application inside, but here, for the purpose of this demo within the container, I have placed only the installation uh, files of um, Chrome and the test studio runner along with uh, the project. And after they are mm -hmm. set up, all you need to do when starting your Docker image is to open its uh, CI, COI and uh, navigate to the corresponding test list. What is a test list, guys? Very quickly here, it's a separate entity, it's a container Again, we're on the containers mm -hmm. topic, but that's it. It's a container of tests, right? One test list can have one test or multiple tests or 100 tests, whatever whatever you want. And this entity is what we use in order to run the tests themselves, no matter on which environment. So I'm here navigating to the corresponding uh, test list from the, from the container. And whenever I execute uh, this, crossing fingers that Docker is in a perfect mood today. It will run in a headless mode, the entire test list. And 
Yep, there we go. It started uh, executing the test. And uh, since it's in headless mode, as I said, the execution speed is quicker. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, you cannot see anything apart from those uh, beautiful which is, which is the point of it. Like, I mean, you, you, you installed Chrome. So it's like, if you did not do yeah. this headless, you can see the browser and see those, uh, you know, things that you're searching on, go to each movie. And uh, I, I actually like your test because, like, since we started building this out, like, last week, Rick, I think, has spent, like, the whole weekend trying to go through all of the Bond movie collections. I, I don't have that kind of time. I, I'm interested in the ones that have at least a certain, uh, you know, movie rating <laughs> and above. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And the cool thing is that in the meantime, I can continue using my machine, yeah. right, and uh, do whatever I have uh, to do. I can even... Uh, go to the movie base and try to replicate what's um, happening. For example, this is what the test will actually do. And since mm -hmm. I'm randomly generated some Bond movies, right? Four Bond movies. The test will run in four uh, iterations. Uh, it will go. It will look for the movie. It will uh, click on it, and it will check uh, the beautiful regex. Will check if this uh, score here is uh, more than six. All right, but as you see now, I'm using my machine, my environment, my infrastructure here. If I if I was to use the UI testing, I should have been with my hands up and just uh, waiting mm -hmm. for everything to to finish and uh, then enjoy the results. And if you have a lot of tests which you need to run repeatedly a lot of times, it will definitely take um, take some time yeah. Uh, yeah. and so I think we're full... no, no I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to recap here so you have a full test and all you have is the test runner um, in, in your docker image right yep the test runner uh, it's again an agent you know this is the, like uh, the soul and the heart the engine of um, test studio and by the way this proprietary framework that we called it uh, ourselves uh, many many years ago so this is a thing what you're seeing uh, that you need to have uh, either in your container or on your CI CD servers uh, agents, uh, whatever they are, or on the machine, uh, your own machine where you want to execute tests. You don't need to have the test studio itself for yeah. uh, so, running those tests there. I think uh, on that front, like when I'm reading the, uh, the Q&A panel here, Kalyani was asking, and I think that's exactly what you're saying, like are these tests created in test studio extension that you're running on, on Docker, correct? Uh, I can, you can, yes and no, uh, because okay. Test Studio is a separate pro, uh, is a separate, as a standalone product, uh, sorry, or a Visual Studio plugin. Uh, you can use it and you can host it on uh, whatever you want, whatever environment uh, you want. So it's not uh, necessary to have Test Studio itself within the Docker environment. What I have now for my current setup, and let me see if I can pull it uh, to you guys from my current setup. Uh, here, where my Docker container is, I just have uh, the runtime edition of uh, mm -hmm. Test Studio, the, the browser, and the project uh, itself. But this project you can copy paste, of course, you can get it from wherever it is uh, created. So, no need for the standalone, entire full standalone version of Test Studio to live in the, in the container itself. Good, good to know. And uh, where is the, you know, the the Azure, uh, you know, pipeline part of it? Because you can run this uh, with yes. Docker in the cloud. Yep, absolutely. By the way, our test just finished. Oh yes. Uh, we, we unfortunately had results which were less than seven. That's why it failed. It had uh, several iterations. By the way, each iteration is run. Uh, we remember we were generating four movies, and even only if one of them. Uh, one of the iterations uh, fails, the overall result will be fail. Of course, you can go and navigate through the walks and see what's uh, what's happening. Uh, the same could be done within our CI CD environment. In our case, I have. Um, oh, you have the pipelines. Okay. All yeah. Right. Um, more or less, the setup is the same. You know, in the case of Azure DevOps, you need to have an environment. Uh, physical or virtual machine where uh, your agent will, uh, the DevOps agent will reside, be it hosted or self-hosted. We support uh, both, of, uh, both of the solutions. And again, the Test Studio runner. So they need to be on the same environment and nothing more than that. After this is set up, whenever 
uh, you create a pipeline bit from for your uh, build releases and whatnot, you need to add a quick command line script again pointing to the runner the mm -hmm. exe uh, file uh, which is called out of the test runner and then again the list uh, which contains um, which contains your test and the same like we did with uh, docker you can manually move uh, those uh, lists to whatever environment uh, you want no need to have the entire version of test studio installed um, into your environment and the cool part is that you can use a task to publish results from devops uh, as well uh, after the tests and the, the pipeline finishes so that uh, you don't switch context um, with uh, with that execution uh, here can be headless uh, as well so if i run it uh, right now again we would not be able to see anything apart from a fancy walk generator which shows um, what's happening on the back end uh, yeah. at, uh, at the moment and just a quick uh, quick one uh, here sam if you allow me uh, here what oh, this, this is, is the dashboard yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk, talking about uh, the results uh, this guy here as you see there is absolutely no login or credentials entering stuff by default it comes uh, with your test studio installation and it lives on port 8085 uh, you can move it uh, if you want but this thing you can uh, point to whatever environment you want and bring it to your customers your colleagues your mm -hmm. other departments so that everybody see what's happening with the overall yeah. health of your project by meaning of seeing the execution of your test lists the last 10 runs here uh you can see i have 50 percent success two of them passed two of them failed and i can enjoy drilling down each of the runs I and can why it fails so we can do the we can do the uh, finger pointing and blame uh, <laughs> absolutely up until the very specific <laughs> step that failed and we can see why it failed uh, thanks to this walk and maybe mm. one of the movies did not match sorry this movie had a value of yeah. six eight and so i'm not, uh, I'm not watching that no yeah, uh, like, it's Spectre. stuff like yeah. Yeah, no, oh, it's Spectre actually, which is uh, it's a decently good movie. So now, like Rick, if you're still on and if you can talk, like these are the kind of things like we also dog food, like when we are shipping our stuff, like uh, in our offices, didn't we have a big TV where we would have like the CI CD pipeline showing? Yeah, we use a lot of our own components, uh, dog fooding, and um, the latest is uh, drinking your own champagne <laughs> is the new nomenclature. But yeah, we use all this stuff, you know, internally as well. No, very cool. All right, Peter. Um, anything else before we switch gears? Uh, you can uh, you can also create, by the way, quickly uh, reports, uh, fancy report uh, definitions out of those results. You know, the project oh, managers, everybody has a seat on the table. All of them uh, love uh, fancy graphs and charts and uh, and stuff. Once you give it a friendly friendly name and select the test list of your choice, you can create and export uh, reports. Um, out, out of that and share it with whoever uh, you want. So indeed, everybody has a seat on the table. I, I told you it's by some audio case. Nice. Yeah. Nice, nice. Very good to know. And uh, you know, thank you for you know answering my okay. questions and you know clearing up uh, some things uh, that I was asking about in you know, the containers. So if I can take uh, you know uh, control back from you for a minute here. Um, before we actually uh, switch gears, uh, we do have a quick poll question, you know, based on all the things that you um, uh, heard us talk about uh, testing-wise. Uh, what is the most common reason for delays in your testing cycle? You know, and you know, uh, Peter kind of talked about all the things. Don't don't let any any of this get in the way. But uh, we are curious, like. Um, uh, Peter, what's your what's your take? Where where do you see most you know customers fall in this realm? Is it the execution that's too slow, or tests that are you know hard to maintain, regression testing not done? If you ask me, it's definitely definitely maintenance, right? Maintenance, Reusability. Yeah. Rick, Rick was showing you some tips and tricks how you can do that with uh, while setting up the, the reporting uh, server. The same can be done reusing the different uh, UI elements. Um, and their attributes within Test Studio, or using tests, uh, using them as part of other tests, so-called test steps and subtests, etc., etc., etc. Meaning that yeah. you can update your tests on the go 
with just a few clicks. You don't need to go over all of them and manually update them in full time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, these are multiple choices. So you might have like more than one thing that you feel, feel is the bottleneck. Um, but uh, do tell us uh, what you feel. And, uh, you know, we have to, uh, we are just at the top of the hour. We have a whole bunch of more things to cover. So for this poll, let's, uh, let's call it uh, going once, going twice. And done, done, done. Look at that. Uh, look at that, uh, Peter. Regression testing is done manually. This is hard. This is hard. Yeah. Imagine if you have a registration page with 200 countries and so, and if you want to manually make sure that you can register with each of the countries, good luck with that, uh, doing it yeah. manually. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, well said. So, uh, you know, folks, we, we understand this is this is hard and that's why uh, we are trying to help. We are trying to listen to our customers uh, and trying to do all the things uh, within Test Studio, giving you all the options of uh, how you want to, you know, uh, write up and uh, have your automated uh, tests, be it, you know, completely automated, be it uh, through some scripting. And then where do you exactly run those tests? How much automation can you bring in? So, uh, you know, with containers, uh, you know, with Azure pipelines, we're trying to give you all the things out of the box. Uh, so, Peter, uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, okay. to you and the team for, you know, uh, bringing testing, you know, um, as a part of our regular dev cycles anyways, uh, something we need to do to have more confidence in the software that we ship. All right, uh, folks, let's uh, let's move on. Let's uh, move on to the next thing. And yay, it's Fiddler time. Hey, Eve, are you on? Hey, I'm doing well. How uh, are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, uh, a couple of uh, releases back, or maybe even uh, one or two years back, uh, we used to talk about Fiddler as a part of, you know, Telerik and Kenti UI. And that was such a disservice because like Fiddler is so popular and like so many of us devs, like we have kind of grown up with Fiddler. So uh, I'm just so glad that uh, we are able to talk about Fiddler separately in all its uh, in all its glory. Uh, so uh, Eve, let me uh, start off with where uh, things are with uh, Fiddler. I know you'd like to talk about the whole family. So what's happening? Yeah, I think that's an important thing to know. A lot of people might be familiar with Fiddler which is now the Fiddler Classic, which has been around you know, for two decades. But Fiddler has really evolved into a whole family of products. So you know, we do have the Fiddler Classic version. We have our Fiddler Everywhere, which is a cross-platform. We have Fiddler Jam, which is your troubleshooting um, solution. And then we have Fiddler Core. And at the heart of it, what Fiddler Everywhere is, is a web debugging proxy, right? Its goal and its um, purpose is to help you monitor edit, um, you know, inspect and log that network traffic. So it gives you that visibility that you don't have, you know, without a tool like this. And I yeah. think that's impressive. I mean, there's so much that Fiddler can do, but you can tailor it to make it what you need. Yeah, and uh, I've been a Fiddler Classic user like on Windows, you know, forever. But, you know, for the last, you know, 10 years or so, uh, Mac is my uh, dev machine uh, most of the time. And I'm just so glad to see Fiddler everywhere just work everywhere, as the name suggests, even on Linux, you know, for yes. those of you who are hardcore. Uh, <laughs> and I, I like the fact that uh, you and the team are trying to think about, you know, you're not just the hardcore users, like we have Fiddler running great, but our users don't want to have all of this stuff running and it's just lightweight in your browser. Um, so uh, one of the biggest expenses when we ship software is you know, supporting our users and uh, how are things triaged um, back to the dev teams? Uh, so your first and second line of support, um, you're giving a lot of visibility into exactly what the user is uh, you know, seeing in their apps, right? Yeah, exactly. I think Peter said, you know, developers don't like switching context. Right. So mm -hmm. within Fiddler Everywhere, you don't have to switch context, you know, between the different platforms and applications or even the team collaboration. I mean, there's any, even integration between, you know, you could like bundle the products, Fiddler Jam mm -hmm. with Fiddler Everywhere. Uh, so I think that's a, a big productivity gain. Yeah. OK, so uh, what is Fiddler Everywhere in, in particular? And I know like the team has spent the last several years kind of bringing this, you know, up from absolutely nothing. So. We're talking about a lot of features here. Yes, I mean, a host um, of features. And this is where you'll see, we have a dedicated development team um, who solely works on Fiddler, professionally supports it. So they're able to invest 100% of their time into making Fiddler Everywhere feature rich. 
you know, across those platforms like we talked about, Windows, Macs, and, or Mac and Linux. Um, but if you go through here, like I said, you know, you might need all of these features, you might need a few, but the main thing is, is to, you know, integrate this into your workflow. It's a streamlined approach. Um, you can, you know, get up and running very quickly. And with all the different features like the advanced filtering, um, the HTTP2 support, WebSocket support, mm, really know, hone I... in on those issues. And I knew you'd get excited. Sam really yes, likes I, the beauty I, of the WebSocket. I, I see a bunch of new things in the base features, but like to your point, like it's it's also a lot of like team uh, collaboration because like you're not uh, running things in silo. So it's how do you share, uh, you know, traffic uh, or, or sessions with your teams and, and how do you work with composers when you're doing APIs? Um, and uh, I, I like the fact that your the team is also very you know upfront about upcoming things in the roadmap. So again, if you uh, want to see something, please uh, you know do speak up and let let us know. So let's dive into a little bit more of what you just touched because there are some big things you mentioned here. Um, right. So what is the new getting started experience? So in 3.0, and you didn't steal my thunder. I'm always happy to share my thunder with you, Sam. Uh, but when you open up Fielder everywhere, you're met with this new dialog box. And I think you have a screenshot of it right here. And it you know, shows you how to enable HTTPS traffic, which is trusting that root certificate. We also have a new way. If you just want to uh, you know, inspect the traffic from a specific Chrome browser instance, you can use the pre-configured browser capturing option. So this is nice if maybe you don't have access to the system mm. proxy or you're unable within your requirements or you know, your dev environment to accept a root certificate. Um, you're right. able to still inspect that traffic within the live uh, traffic tab, and then mobile. That's nice, because like uh, so. Back to your point, like you, you're saying, like if my IT has restrictions or for some reason I'm not able to accept a certificate, so I can see HTTPS traffic, you could still open up like one tab in Chrome and let me kind of look at, yes. look through that. Yep, exactly. And it's and I you know once I get into it in the demo time, I'll show you, but. Um, it's a drop down a button and it opens that browser instance and right there you're able to see that traffic coming in. Nice. You mentioned something about mobile. Yes. So that's one of the other things, you know, that people sometimes um, don't realize, like I, said, like I said, it's so expansive, the offering, but sometimes the mobile is what people want to get to. So on this new getting started screen, we gave you some information, um, you know, whether it be uh, Android devices or, you know, the device of your choice to get started with um, traffic, you know, taking that mobile traffic. And I love that, you know, like the web, the browsers are, you know, we can figure out what's going on in the network a little bit if we tinker around, but the moment you talk about native apps and you know, like that's where I live with, you know, uh -huh. native and desktop apps, I have no visibility unless I'm looking at uh, Fiddler. So I, I love the fact that we are making it easy for, and the best part is uh, you can actually look at, you know, your phone or your iPad and just like be able to look at traffic that's going through your device. It doesn't even need to be on the same machine. So I love that. Um, but HTTP2, uh, that's big. Yeah, so this is real big. I mean, people have to support different protocol versions, right? Uh -huh. And just, a little background, HTTP2 is the latest uh, revision of that protocol. Uh, so, you know, whether you're 1.1, 1.0, you know, 2.0, you're able to, again, uh, you know, test those and even revert back between the protocols, um, depending on what your needs are. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the WebSocket support, uh, as you have mentioned, because uh, this is so cool to be able to go like one level lower than HTTP. Like what happens when a client and server can talk to each other uh, and they have a you know a full duplex uh, connection and it's just a very low level communication happening and now uh, Fiddler can actually capture that. Yeah. Um, what, what is uh, advanced filtering? So advanced filtering, and I'll get into this too when we get into demo, but uh, previous versions of Fiddler Everywhere, you were able to do filtering kind of based on requests and responses. But what we've done is we have increased the different conditions and allowed you to create multiple. So whether it be protocol, um, IP, and all of these different, and I've shown you the drop down, I think there's like a dozen of them. But mm -hmm. you can build upon these to really narrow in on your network traffic. Because you and I have talked about once you uh, get into filter, it's kind of embarrassing how much traffic yes. that it captures, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, you easily get lost. Sometimes it's a needle in the haystack. So these advanced filters allow you um, to really figure out what you need quickly. Um, we call them, you know, complex, but they're not complex and set up. It just gives you those different parameters and there's no yeah. limit, you know, to what, yeah. 
to the amount of conditions that you can apply. Yeah, and it uh, looks like you uh, did more work um, on the you know on the composer side. So if I'm building Rick and API, I have more you know bells and whistles to play around with uh, before I ship my API. Yes, you do. I mean, there's right. so many different insights that you can get from the composer, and it's very powerful. All right, enough talk. How about you show us stuff? Okay, uh, I can do so that. Let me uh, bring you up. All right, you should be free to share. Okay. Um, next webinar, I'll be ready with my James Bond tie-in. I'm glad you had Fiddler, you know, with the API in the beginning, um, so I wasn't left out, but do not have much on the James Bond front here. Uh, can you see my screen, Sam? Yes, yeah, we are good. Okay. So, yes, this is what I was talking about real quick, how we have, you know, those three buckets. Um, I already have the system traffic capturing turned on, uh, which you can see here. Uh, this would be the pre-configured browser capturing, and this is how you get started easily with the devices. So this pops up for the first time. Um, I go ahead and X out, and I'm ready. And as you can see here, I've had this running probably since the start um, of the yeah, webinar today. <laughs> right? I oh, mean, it would be, you could keep scrolling. Um, yeah. But the thing I want to point out real quick here is this new HTTP2, right? So this is something new, and you can see the different protocol mm -hmm versions that, you know, the different sites that I'm hitting were returning. Um, and let's say I just want to work with my HTTP2 traffic. I'm not going to go into the advanced filter. I can filter it right from here and filter. And it's also a way for you to kind of see which apps are using HTTP2. Right. I <laughs> mean, you have a them, preference. Yeah. I mean, there's some of them you you're expect that are using it. Yeah. And the others, you know, you, you might not know until you start looking mm -hmm. into it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah and then nice. even we have talked about it, like uh, modern websites, when we pull it up, and if you have Fiddler running, this is a network proxy, everything goes through that. It's uh, it's a little embarrassing sometimes, like how much uh, it takes for the modern web to run, like how many calls we make, and you know, when you have like uh, Microsoft and Apple and Google, uh, their their services are running and they're calling home, and you, know, you see all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just show you real quick, this is, like, you know, we talked about when you edit in the Composer, um, this is where you can, you know, change those protocol versions. You can execute, uh, you know, if you have certain things, you can also create new collections and save them, which is nice. Um, and then down here, you know, in the response, you can get, um, you know, the headers and the cookies, the preview and the body. So that's pretty yeah. exciting within the, within the I, Composer. I also like your, uh, I like your uh, theme and these, these themes are changeable, oh, right? Yes. Yes, there's four different themes. This is the newer dark theme that came out later last year. We do still have, you know, the popular light theme, and then we have kind of two that are in the middle. Yeah, so really good uh, yeah too, there's no right or wrong. Their own. Exactly. Yes. I, I still love my light themes. I know you do. I didn't want to. Didn't want to go too far there with you, but yes. <laughs> um, and over here too, we have some new indicators that you're going to see. You know, that with with the different protocol versions and. As I mentioned with the overview tab, um, I mean, there's so much information that you can get here. And you see, I mean, I haven't had to do much in terms of clicking. Uh, now, when I want to get into the advanced filters, this is something I was talking about here. Uh, this is where you can say if any of these conditions are met, none of these, and then this is that big list. And I think I may oh. have shown this before, Sam, but I mean, yes. post, yeah, I haven't quite got the acronym to remember all of them yet. But, you know, it's like a big one. You know, like Michigan is homes, like Huron, Ontario. I haven't quite figured out what I can do to remember each of these. <laughs> um, but so what's it nice, and then you can add them. So if I did URLs equal to, um, and then I did on a path is, ends with this, you know, I can apply. So I can just keep going and build upon these filters. So that information that I'm looking for, if I know, I'm going to be able to hone on it very quickly. Yeah, makes sense. So, uh, like the filters, they kind of add on, right? You could say, like, show me stuff from just this domain and only the 404s. Yes. Yep. You can even, when I go into results here, I could do, you know, I don't have any 404s, but if I did, they would show up right here. It would be that easy. And I didn't show this earlier. This is that open in browser. Yes. So, this yes. is that. Re Pre-configured browser process. 
Oh, you love your hash node. I love my hash node. Need a James Bond one, but I didn't. I guess I did, missed out on that. So in in this case, like you're able to bring up just one tab, and uh, you know, without it being a network proxy, you can still uh, inspect all the things. Yep. Yep. Right. Nice. Right from this, everything would come right into that live traffic tab. You know, for this particular instance. Love it. Love um, it. Now I know you've been dying to go over to the WebSocket. Um, would now be a good time to hand that over to you, Sam? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so let's uh, switch back over because uh, the moment you know, uh, even uh, the team told me that you could do that. I, I've been excited. I've been very excited about this. Uh, so let me show you, uh, you know, a couple of things. Uh, first up, uh, let's uh, collapse this, and I'm going to pull up my uh, browser, and and actually I'm going to um, get Fiddler everywhere going. Uh, so it's going to come up, and uh, I did uh, had it running, and then I closed it. So it's going to give me that getting started experience one more time, and uh, get started up. And so one thing I uh, I like playing around uh, with, and I have done you know for years and years now, is you know real time apps. I'm a big fan uh, because uh, you know it uh, you know think about how many uh, gaming situations, how many polls, or how many things we do every day which uh, need like real time apps. Uh, but one of the you know simplest uh, things that developers get to play around with is like chat, right? So that's that's real time as it gets. So I have a super simple app that's uh, you know deployed uh, to Azure, but it's using a, a technology called Signal R, and uh, it's just uh, it's a, it's just a real time app that just does chat. There's a there's a hub, um, and that hub is actually sitting in Azure, so it can scale. And it just like broadcasts to every uh, everybody who can connect. Um, so in here um, you can come in. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the uh, just a little uh, UI. So we could say Sam says hello, and I can do a send, and it shows up right here. So let's uh, take a look at what uh, Fiddler uh, did with that. So again, it started capturing, and it's a lot of stuff. So I'm going to filter this down to Signal R, which is exactly my app. So give me one second. Didn't want to uh, cough in your ears. Uh, okay, so here's the uh, app for starting up, saying, "Hey, I, I, I am HTTPS and all that stuff." You can see that it's starting to do a little bit of like negotiation here. So it's trying to see between the server and the client. The server is uh, where it's uh, it's hosted in Azure, and the client is my web app here. Uh, what can the two of them talk? So it has a few fallback plans, like it's it could do server uh, like long polling, it could do you know server sent events, but ideally on a you know modern browser and a, a you know web um, uh, supported app, you want to talk web sockets because that's low level and that's like super fast. It's by duplex. So someone in in here, you're going to see this little uh, thing here, and if I hover over that, it's showing me that hey, it's a tunnel is being used for web sockets. So now you know the client and the server are uh, talking over web sockets. So what the Fiddler team, uh, Fiddler Everywhere has done is very conveniently marked it that, hey, from this point forward, everything is web sockets. So you're not going to see any more HTTP traffic, which would be a blocker for you, right? The moment you had web sockets, you couldn't see anything. But now you have a messages uh, tab here. And uh, right here, Sam says hello. That's showing up right here. And the other ones, like the blue and the greens, that's just like the handshaking, keeping it going, right? So uh, we can come back here. And we could say Eve says uh, hola, and we could send. It shows up right here. We go back to Fiddler, and uh, somewhere down here is Eve saying hola, right? So, so nice and convenient to be able to you know see uh, WebSocket traffic between you know modern apps and their server backends. But that's just for the web, and it's it's great to see that we can have uh, things working for the web. But uh, like I said, I'm a native uh, app developer. I want to see things on mobile and desktop because without Fiddler, I have no visibility, right? So this was a web app, um, uh, the one that uh, I showed you here. But what if I took the same app and I switched uh, just the client part of it uh, to not being web and instead being something a little bit more uh, native like mobile or desktop? So I have uh, an app open here. Uh, this is my Visual Studio for uh, Mac. I'm on a Mac and works the same way on Windows. And, and this happens to be a, a Xamarin app. So I have this running on iOS. I have this running on Android or Mac. And uh, you know we talked about this uh, yesterday where we were talking about all the, the Telerik stuff. Uh, .NET MAUI is coming. So that's our cross-platform way of taking .NET 
to iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. So this will all uh, be working the same way. So what I'm doing here is I have switched up the client side package. I'm now using a you know Signal Art client package, and I am connecting up to that same you know hub that's sitting in Azure, uh, and I want to see this working on my mobile phone. So I did deploy. Um, and here is my simulator. This is the iPhone simulator. Again, works the same way on Android. Um, so I'm going to open this up, and uh, we're going to wait for the handshake to happen. Now we are opening up uh, another port uh, to that uh, thing. Now even me do web. Uh, Rick is uh, way too cool. He just likes to work <laughs> always on his uh, on his uh, uh, phone. So Rick is going to say OMG send. So that shows up right there. Let's go back to the web, and this is, we are still connected, same app, right? So Rick says OMG is connected to the same hub that's broadcasting it down to everywhere. But here's the uh, nice thing here. I can go to Fiddler, no more traffic, because again, this is WebSockets. Uh, but somewhere down here, um, if I haven't missed it already, uh, maybe, uh, oh, this thing is uh, scrolling off uh, to one side here, let's see. Uh, and my resolution is super big, so I can't scroll too well, uh, but that right there is um, Rick's message. Uh, you, can, it can, you can kind of see. Uh, can, I, can I double click on this? Uh, let's see. It's capturing me. Oh, maybe I can look at the message. Oh, there it is. Like, see, Rick says OMG right there. So <clears throat> this is WebSockets traffic. This is low level, and now you have uh, Fiddler capturing it. You know, and this works not just for web, for desktop and mobile apps as well. Uh, you know, this is super exciting, uh, Eve. I, I love the fact that we are able to kind of dig through real-time apps which are connected to, uh, you know, to servers over, you know, WebSockets connection. And without this, we would have no visibility whatsoever. So uh, this is just so nice. I can just, uh, you know, keep on doing stuff here uh, and it all, all shows up. Let's, let's do one more, uh, you know. Uh, since we have Misha, who's been like patiently waiting just to make sure that I didn't uh, not mishap. Look at that, this iOS uh, autocorrecting me to mishap. That's not good. All right, we want to say Misha uh, saying, uh, I'm cool. And send, that shows up right there. And this one here, uh, right there in Fiddler, is um, yeah, Misha saying, I'm cool, right there, right? So no more HTTPS traffic. You see absolutely no more traffic going through. So again, without the WebSocket support, you'll be blind because you won't know because uh, there are no more HTTP uh, you know, requests or responses being made. So I'm super excited to see this Eve. Yeah, and then that live traffic, uh, there's an icon that lets you know, you know, that's WebSocket, so it indicates. Yes, it. yes, that one right there, and it's green. Yeah. And again, when you disconnect, it actually conveniently goes red so to say like that that connection has been uh, stopped. So super nice so, and yeah. Uh, yeah, very nice. Lots to of see. great visual cues. I think that's important too as you're going through things. If you can get stuff, you know, at a, at a glance or visualize it like on some of those um, overview tabs or inspectors tabs it just really makes it makes sense quickly yeah so i'm i'm super uh you know fond of all the work that you know the fiddler team is uh, you know putting uh together uh to make all of this happen and you know enable us uh, with all the visibility that uh, we care for so now that we've talked about fiddler here's a quick poll keeping it a little interactive for all of you um what would you predominantly use uh, fiddler everywhere for Right, and uh, you know, um, as a native developer, I have my preferences, but we want to know what, uh, how you envision uh, using this. Is it mostly web debugging, uh, or uh, and and maybe this is the thing that uh, Eve we didn't quite touch upon, but it's the mocking of re requests and responses that Fiddler is really good at. Yeah, we didn't get into that as much. Um, that's within the rules builder. But what you can do yes. is you can simulate, you know, server drops or if your CSS fails to load, you know, what will that action be? Or you can, you know, uh, prompt auth authentication. There's so much that right. you can do. So you're not, you're never surprised what the outcome's going to be. Yeah, I'll and especially, absolutely. And especially like for mobile apps, right? We go in and out of traffic. We have bad reception zones. So what happens if your JavaScript or, uh, you know, CSS files don't get delivered on time? What is the user experience like? So mm -hmm. you can simulate all of that uh, through Fiddler. So yeah, folks, uh, tell us how you want to see Fiddler, uh, you know, help you in the workflows or the type of apps that you're building. Uh, is it web debugging? Is it response and request mocking? Or is it looking into HTTPS traffic or, you know, mix of both? So you got multiple choices here and uh, going once, going twice. 
and let's see where you're all at. Oh, okay. wow, okay. So 87 percent of you, and again, I mean, this is not adding up to 100 percent. So uh, some of you want uh, want multiple things, which is great. But you know, web debugging is still uh, the predominant use, and that that's totally cool. That's why you have those advanced filters. That's why you have the you know request and response mocking tools, so you can you know fake out your servers. You can uh, you know. Uh, your your developers can you know for web stuff you can test out your APIs the best you can um, before you have your client apps consume that so good to know good to know all right we've been uh, going strong we are an hour and a half in um, Eve anything else uh, you want to mention on the fiddler front no I just thank you for the time and I'll let Misha bring it home I know you have some good stuff to share. Yeah, and again, uh, folks, for everything that we're talking about, uh, keep an eye out on the roadmaps because there is a lot uh, we are cooking. Uh, Peter kind of uh, opened the door a little bit to uh, some new things coming in Test Studio. Reporting team has been super busy, and the Fiddler team is on, uh, you know, on a, on a high, you know, rolling out so many features. Yeah. Uh, please, so thank you, Eve, and uh, thank big you. thank you to the to the full uh, Fiddler team. Yes, I'll pass All along. All right. Yes. Uh, now. Uh, I know Misha has been patiently waiting uh, to show off, uh, mm -hmm. you know, unit testing and mocking. So let's talk just mock. And uh, Misha, thanks for uh, being here. I know you wear a lot of different hats because uh, you are, you know, you manage yeah, the whole yeah. product, and you know, uh, you uh, talk to clients. You are trying to do what is right uh, for for just mock, and this is uh, very close to home for a lot of developers. Uh, so tell us uh, first up, what is Terry just mock? Well, for uh, those of you that uh, already know uh, uh, or don't know, Delirious Mock is a mocking framework and it is uh, used uh, in uh, unit testing. And uh, the reason why we need a um, mocking framework is uh, uh, just because we need to isolate uh, our code that we want to test from all external dependencies. And um, what are those external dependencies? Well, they can be, uh, let's say, some kind of service, some kind of REST service, or connection to a database, or usage of a, a third-party library, or anything that is actually not related to the logic that uh, you actually want to, to test. And uh, with just mock, uh, you can uh, create a mock of uh, this uh, external dependency and uh, just uh, configure it in a way that it will uh, return or provide the uh, data or the results that uh, it is the most suitable for your testing scenario that you are currently writing. And yeah, with uh, in essence, just more helps you to isolate the code that you want to test from all external dependencies. Yeah, no, and, and that is such a key point. Like when we strive to write unit tests, like a lot of you know enterprises want to have code coverage, but you're not going to get that code coverage unless you're able to mock it out because you have so many dependencies on your know, services and database calls and authentication and all of that good stuff. So you need a mocking framework. So I'm glad that you and the team uh, spend all the energy that you uh, can uh, towards just mock. So. Let's talk about what's new, and you got some big things that you've been cooking up. Uh, first up, what is the whole performance optimization? Well, uh, we were uh, working hard to, to improve the performance of JustMock uh, because uh, JustMock is using a profiler to do uh, its job. And uh, when you pour a profiler into the CLR, the common language runtimes, that uh, brings uh, an additional performance hit. And we know that uh, when something is slow, uh, uh, the developer is not very happy. And this is why we uh, we wanted to emphasize on that. And for the past uh, probably one year, we are um, releasing uh, new features that are, uh, in essence, optimization of that uh, performance. But with this release, we did something uh, really major. And um, we managed to um, optimize just mock uh, profiler and uh, the optimization is between 40% for the worst case and 9% uh, for the best case where wow. worst case is that yeah where the worst case is when you mock uh, probably all the code that you have let's say in different unit tests you you 
you will ha have to mock each of the methods that you have written in your application. And of course, the, the best case scenario is uh, when you have just few unit tests that are using this mock. And uh, that performance optimization is based on the fact that uh, just mock now can works on demand. So and you're, course, you're saying the the so you essentially what you're saying is if I can understand like the, whenever we have a method that you're trying to mock, uh, you have some instrumentation that gets attached to the method, and now you can yeah. delay uh, that until is that until runtime? Uh, this is when uh, when the unit test starts to execute and okay. uh, the code finds that uh, you are using just mock API for a particular arrangement for let's say that method that uh, you want to to mock and then we in essence we are overwriting uh, mm -hmm. that that method to just include our logic as well yeah and no, this, I mean, is, this is done on demand yeah yeah now, so I mean Clearly, this is probably the direction we want to go, but this is a big change, like you said, right? So this is right now uh, available to you as an option um, in your extension. Yeah, it is available as an option in the in the extension, or uh, with uh, with uh, additionally with a few other uh, options that uh, are again impacting the the performance uh, and depends on the uh, if you are using a particular feature, you can uh, leave it enabled or if you don't want to use it, you can disable it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So this is brand new, folks. Uh, I think Misha and the yeah. team are looking for feedback, so use it. And Misha, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to seeing um, uh, what, what you can do with it. But uh, before we go on, you have a bunch of new future-facing things that I absolutely love. And I mean, talking about, uh, talk about being on the bleeding edge, uh, Visual Studio 2022 is out uh, as of November and uh, you have full support for it, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have full support for Visual Studio 2022 and, of course, for the uh, official release of the .NET 6. And, yes. uh, yeah, we are currently preparing uh, uh, examples uh, that are shipped with uh, the JustMock installation uh, mm -hmm. that will target .NET 6 and we will provide that with uh, probably our next uh, source pack. Yeah. And like C sharp 10 uh, in there as well, and and this is kind of real nice because as we have seen, like with .NET 6 having the uh, LTS badge, a lot of customers are thinking about modernization and you know migrating their apps. So a lot of .NET 6 uh, targeting code is being written right now. Uh, so being able to be able to use JustMock inside of Visual Studio 2022 for your .NET 6 apps, uh, you know, for any apps uh, that are running on .NET 6, that that's pretty cool. Okay, so Misha, enough talk. Uh, how about uh, I give you the floor and you show us uh, some yeah. stuff? So let's make you the presenter here. Um, and you should have the rights to share screen. Okay, just let me know if uh, you can yep, see Yep, we see it. We see it. Okay, cool. So uh, this is just to 2022, as uh, you can see. Uh, I have uh, built the examples that uh, we are shipping with uh, JustMock, and this is targeting uh, .NET Framework currently. Uh, the options, actually the new options, uh, is that window where um, you can control yes. the, the, yeah, the, the, the options of the profiler and uh, on-demand instrumentation. So for comparison, just to, uh, to show to the uh, viewers, uh, I will run first the, the test without the uh, on-demand instrumentation. And I will actually check the, the time in the test uh, output window because it actually measures um, from the start of the execution of the test until the, the end. And uh, uh, after that, I will um, enable the on-demand optimization and we will see what will happen. Yeah, so, so uh, what, what, no, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, currently the, uh, yeah, the tests are uh, executed and uh, the profile has been uh, attached to the CR. Mm -hmm. So what type of, um, um, you know, project is this? How many tests uh, do you have in there? Uh, well, 
currently no, those are around 200 uh, tests okay. and they're executed for around 26 uh, seconds well it depends on the uh, machine from on the different machines but uh, yeah typically 20 26 seconds and i will now uh enable that optimization and we will expect drop in the performance uh yeah, the, the time to, to execute the best to and the test to be reduced significantly. I love that. Like brand new feature, you're toggling the switch uh, and showing us a live presentation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Just uh, with the click of a button. And uh, uh, guys, we are currently uh, leaving this as an option for you to uh, enable and uh, to experiment. And uh, please get back to us uh, with, uh, with your findings. So we want to to verify that uh, everything's worked correctly in uh, each of the scenarios. So the yeah. tests are done and you can see that we have uh, eight seconds out of 26. Wow, well done, well done. And I, I see that you're looking at the bottom more on the output window rather than you know the test execution direction. You, you find that to be more accurate? Yeah, I found that to be more accurate because uh, this is the measurement from uh, the time that the VS test uh, 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 console uh, process is started until it's finished. So it's uh, those are those are just uh, uh, reported from the VS test uh, console, and those are actually the time that from the process started until everything is done. Cool. Big, big uh, jump in performance. Love that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would like to show also. Uh, let me just uh, open the currently prepared uh, test for uh, .NET 6. So you can see that the tests are for .NET 6. Can you, um, uh, uh, when you're showing code, maybe bump up the font a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I, I there you go. So, yeah, uh, .NET 6. I will do the solution. Okay, this really. and I will encourage everybody to just uh, uh, migrate uh, their application to uh, .NET 6 and to .NET Core if you can to .NET 6 because there are so much optimizations there. Yeah. On, only the optimizations are so 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 That's great. Just yeah. You, yeah, yeah, it is worth it for, for you to migrate your application, uh, of course, if you have that uh, opportunity. And for comparison, we were watching uh, with the on-demand optimization there um, around um, 18 seconds of execution time, and uh, now we are waiting that to, to finish. And yeah, here uh, is just... No, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, here we have just four or five seconds of execution. Wow, very nice, very nice. Now you had uh, mentioned something about, uh, you know, the way the methods are orchestrated. Uh, there, there's something to be, uh, you know, careful about, uh, kind of moving into this on-demand mode. Uh, well, those are uh, for some of the other options. Uh, well, oh, I, I will explain them. And uh, can I zoom that? No, I can't. Yeah, probably so, not. There, there, there is an option for you to uh, enable or disable whether you you want to mock um, some methods that are marked with the DOM import attribute. So this is uh, a feature that uh, highly impacts the, the performance. So if you don't uh, uh, don't want to mock such uh, methods and, or you don't use them, you can just simply uh, disable that. The asynchronous test uh, context resolution is also uh, depending on, uh, as the name suggests, on the asynchronous uh, uh, test that uh, you can uh, write. If you don't uh, use uh, async test, uh, you can, of course, disable it. And the last option is the auto mock uh, repository cleanup. Uh, what uh, this is doing by default when the, uh, it's turned on is uh, to the just mock profiler is inserting a call to mock reset at the end of uh, each method. 
I will just uh, quickly show what this looks like. So we have uh, a regular method that uh, use some mock, and at the end uh, the profiler is just calling that this this line of code. Why is why this is uh, important? Well, because um, um, when you create a mock. Uh, you you can create it let's say on a static method and uh, this static method is not uh, uh, bound to some object that the garbage collector can uh, collect and uh, this is why uh, yeah and uh, that uh, mock uh, can just uh, stare there in the air and if you don't uh, call mock reset uh, uh, there will be uh, a memory leak so the just mock profiler is doing that uh, for you automatically, but if you want to squeeze uh, everything that is possible from the uh, performance standpoint, you can add that uh, mock reset code to each of your uh, unit tests that are using uh, just mock and uh, simply disable that uh, set it to false. But uh, please uh, have in mind that if you don't do it for each of your unit tests, this will uh, lead to potentially will lead to memory leaks. So please use it with uh, with caution. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, yeah, this is this is great. I, I love the fact that the team is like so much on the bleeding edge. Like um, as soon as things are released uh, from Visual Studio from .NET, you're you're right on top of it, and you're helping us mock you know uh, code that's running on the latest frameworks with the latest tools. So. Love that, love that. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Anything else uh, you wanted to talk about? Well, uh, I can uh, quickly share that uh, for the next release, we uh, will probably uh, deliver on the implementation of uh, the uh, C-sharp feature uh, that uh, the uh, interfaces have uh, already default implementation. And uh, currently the commercial version uh, does not support that and we will probably uh, deliver that feature. And uh, another interesting thing is that uh, uh, we will work on creating uh, uh, mock arrangements on specific uh, uh, methods. Let's say uh, you have that method, you can click, uh, let's say, what with the right button and just uh, click on a button that says uh, generate uh, a mock for that method. And uh, yeah. Those are the things that are, are in our plan. Nice, uh, nice. I love that we are, you know, dropping hints at uh, the roadmap at, as to what lies next for each of the products. Yeah. All right, Misha. So if uh, if that's all you want to show, I'm going to steal uh, uh, the screen uh, back from you. Uh, we want to be a little careful of your time. I'm uh, watching the time here, so we we are doing good. Um, so uh, this is this has been uh, so nice to kind of uh, see all the things that are cooking across uh, all the productivity uh, suites. But since all of you are around, let's uh, do a quick round of uh, you know Q and A. And um, folks, uh, please feel free to um, keep asking more questions. And a quick thank you to uh, our folks who are in the back channels and been answering questions uh, a lot. So. Um, let's see if I can go through some of those things which um, uh, which all of you might help me answer. Uh, so let's start with you, Eve. Um, Rick was asking about uh, Fiddler Everywhere and um, the, essentially the subscription plan. How does that relate? So can you uh, tell us a little bit more? So yeah, with Fiddler Everywhere, you have a subscription model that gives you a monthly or annual option. Um, so of course, the the annual is is a better value if you're looking at it um, and if you're using Fiddler you know into your into your workflow that's the way you're going to want to go yeah and then there right. is a pro plan and there is an enterprise plan too I should mention that that's um, to choose from the enterprise plan is only an annual subscription but it offers you um, some advanced features priority support SSO some things along those lines but I definitely recommend you know checking it out all of the descriptions are on our pricing page. If you need help or you have a specific need, we have a team uh, that can help walk you through that too. Good to know. Good to know. Um, uh, let's uh, switch to uh, Rick here. And again, some of these questions may have already been answered. I'm just trying to you know, bring out some of the ones that may be benefiting all of us. Uh, so Les was, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm um, 
uh, going to be able to uh, articulate the question for you. But essentially, uh, for reporting uh, solutions, uh, if there is a REST service, um, uh, oh, and essentially the question is about implementing a course, which is the cross-origin uh, uh, thing, which is tricky. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, enabling, um, you know, REST services that might be uh, from a certain server on your on your enterprise and making it work across? Uh, have you seen issues with course? Uh, no, no. So with telework reporting, it's a standard .NET service. So you just if you have a cross origin request being made, which would be a scenario where your front end is on a different server than your back end. Um, the uh, you have to enable cores so it doesn't get um, you know you don't have a triggered cross origin exception but it's a standard .NET procedure um, the only thing that might be an issue is I don't know if this has been fixed but I know there was a bug with Chrome and localhost where cores didn't work correctly so if you're doing this all in development and you're deploying your application in localhost and testing in Chrome you might see some cores exceptions the um, I think the fix for that is just either do a local deployment uh, to like um, your local IIS and not running in localhost, uh, or there's some other workarounds, so just use a different browser. Yeah, okay. Um, Sujata was asking, you know, you how you showed up the report book, which is essentially a collection of reports in a single uh, book, and you have uh, the table of contents. Uh, like, let's say if you start around, uh, you know, with just a couple of reports, like how do you actually make it a book? Like, is there a UI for that? Yeah, so that's what we added in the report, the web report designer. This cycle is a UI for creating report books, and I didn't have time to open it up in the developer and in the designer to show you. But it's basically just a collection of reports. It has a slightly different report format. Um, normal reports are TRDP, um, Telework uh, uh, Document uh, Reporting uh, Package. This is a TRDB uh, uh, for book, but uh, basically it's just a collection of reports. So if you open up that file of that type and you add the various reports in the collection, you can drag them around the UI to determine which one goes first, which one goes second. And the table of contents is just another um, another small micro report that you create separately. You can configure and style it as needed and drop that into the section in the report book. It's actually, um, I'm making it sound more difficult than it is. It's really simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have step-by-step uh, -step documentation to show, you how to show you how to do it too. Good. All right. I think I know the answer to this, but uh, Phil was asking if the React report viewer uh, works without the report server. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Any of our report viewers will either connect to report server or the telework reporting SDK service. Um, it's just whether you build it yourself or you use the one that we prepackage. Under the covers, it's the exact same runtime engine. All right, good to know. And uh, if, if I may try to combine maybe some questions, and uh, you know, sorry if, uh, to Peter and even Misha, you can you can see where enterprises, uh, you know, uh, struggle a lot with reporting, and that's that's where reporting solutions can really help. So a lot of questions here for Rick. Um, some folks were asking about you know printing because you you showed up a little bit of you know uh, you know the A4 size thingy. How do you set it up uh, to print? But uh, do, does it have like different needs for like different printer interfaces? Is there things we need to do for different printers, or we let the system uh, go off and do it by itself? Yeah, by and large, um, reporting is going to use the Windows print drivers. Uh, so it will just output to whatever printer is um, available in Windows, whether that be a, a thermal um, printer used for receipts or an old fashioned dot matrix printer or uh, laser or printers, anything in between. Um, so it just, it's going to use the, the Windows printing service. The only, uh, the only exception to that is very, very old printers that still use um, direct serial connections and don't use a printer driver. Uh, that can be a bit tricky. So you have to use an interface to um, receive the print um, in the Windows services or well, the print services is then necessarily have to be Windows um, and then relay that to the serial output for you know very, very, very old legacy um, machines. Yeah, okay. Um, Phil asks one more question here. Uh, you know, when you generate a report uh, and you see it on, you know, a, a larger form factor versus down to mobile, uh, there is some responsiveness going on. So is, is that built in or are there docs to kind of help with that? 
yeah, this is where it can get a bit interesting because um, keep in mind, telework reporting is a paged format, and part of the the whole point is that you have that that um, that guaranteed layout. So the report is always going to be the same scale, the same proportions. Mm -hmm. uh, so the report itself is not what you'd call responsive because it's not going to resize itself based on the display. That, that completely defeats the, the purpose of it. Right. Um, what it will do is scale. So it will scale itself down to fit. However, the report viewer, the interactive UI component, which you actually display the report in, is completely responsive. So that will adapt to your automatically to your device, and you know, um, do change the menus and layout, and uh, you get the, the the side scroll, the side drawer hamburger menu on a small format device. But the actual body of the report, all it can do for that layout is to, is to scale itself down. Um, so right. otherwise, you would you would lose the you you would lose the that the fidelity um, of how the report yeah, looks like yeah. the pixel perfect layout. Which, you know, it's it's mm -hmm. one of the core properties. Yeah. All right, uh, Rene uh, was asking, like, we are new and uh, we're just getting started with Web Report Designer. Are there beginner tutorials or manuals? I, I think so, right, on the product pages? Uh, and I think there are, like, videos on how to get started with Web Report Designers. Yeah, absolutely. So if you just want something very specific, you know, our documentation um, will have, you know, that very narrow focused article to answer that specific question. But if you're really just getting started and want to just learn everything really quickly and get up to speed, we have the virtual classroom, which is available to every licensed user, either paid or trial. Uh, and you can take a full self-paced course in telework reporting, you know, suit the nuts. Yeah. All right. Well said. Um, so let me ask maybe a general question that I have been, uh, you know, thinking in my mind to, you know, Eve and Peter. Like, do you see, uh, you know, Fiddler and like testing kind of working together in scenarios? Like, and either of you feel free to, uh, you know, speak up your your mind. But do you see the two of them play together? Hundred percent. They do. Yeah. So, like, uh, what kind of what kind of scenarios are you thinking? I can tell you from uh, again from my experience and uh, stuff. First and foremost, uh, you can uh, the API the API tests um, that you create. Uh, and by the way, uh, Fedora Core, the engine itself is also incorporated within uh, yeah. Test Studio under yeah, the hood. Yeah, so even we didn't don't talk about that enough. Like there, there's just so much cool things with Fiddler. Uh, so Fiddler Core. Uh, so before Peter uh, kind of uh, explains how to use it, it is essentially a little uh, you know engine that runs uh, the core of Fiddler. You can embed that in your in your applications in your .NET dashboards. Yep. Yeah. And most importantly, you can use your API tests within your UI tests, like a subtest as part of the script, meaning that once you run your UI, you can also do your RESTful API testing, uh, for example, with the same script and automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in, in a, a good way, point. no, sorry, you go on. No, that's a good point. Like we've been talking about internally, you know, the testing pyramid and we, you know, if you look at that pyramid, you know, one of our products, um, you know, is gonna fit in every section of that and some are complementary. Um, so, you know, stay tuned. We'll have more of, of that elaborate story, but yes. All right. And in a way, I like the fact that like everything we talked about today, it's kind of uh, all coming together, right? It's it's one thing for, you know, all of our Telerik and Kenda UI, UI components, giving developers all the power to, you know, write our apps. But then when it comes to troubleshooting and having more confidence, like all of this plays together. Like you, you, you need JustMock to write your unit tests. Then you need Fiddler to kind of see what's going on uh, under the, uh, you know, uh, under the traffic uh, uh, things. And then you need testing to uh, have more confidence while you ship stuff and, you know, build up your, you know, test suite and have more regression testing and run it in uh, Docker containers. And again, if you need reports, which everybody does, then you uh, look at reporting solutions. So we are trying, you know, we are trying to give you all the things uh, to be uh, successful, and uh, we we hope it helps. And um, any any more parting thoughts, folks? Are we all good? All right. Uh, so uh, before we leave here, uh, one quick shout out uh, back to uh, Twitch again. Again, if you have the time, or if you just want to go to YouTube and watch this. Uh, uh, on uh, at your own pace, like maybe late at night. Um, if you don't want to spend during the daytime, that's totally cool. But if you want to see us in action, kind of maybe 
uh, very real, kind of sometimes struggling through uh, our development, uh, you can come and hang out with us on Twitch. It's uh, Coded Live. That's where we live stream a lot of the times in the in the uh, in a week. Uh, so you see us for the webinars where we do the big releases, but this is us, you know, every day. Uh, so come and join us, and you can see us, you know, uh, tinkering with our stuff uh, all the time. So please do. And uh, one more time, uh, thank you, thank you for your time. I know this was, uh, you know, a lot of different things to cover in in two hours, but uh, I'm glad we we're able to look at all of the productivity stuff aside from just the UI uh, components and all the things we do for developers, because this is so important as we uh, ship software. So. Um, big thank you to Rick and Peter and Eve and Misho. Uh, Peter and Misho are actually in Sofia, Bulgaria, in Europe. It's uh, kind of getting late uh, in the evening for them. Hopefully, uh, the two of you can go and relax now. Uh, but uh, like I said, we do stand, um, you know, on the shoulder of our teams who uh, have been putting together all of this goodness. So thank you to, uh, you know, all of our teams and especially folks in the back channels and our social teams. Uh, you know, and thank you to all of you, our customers who use our stuff, you give us feedback and you, uh, you know, you push us to do more every release. So thank you to all of you. All right. And with that, I think uh, that that's a wrap. That's a wrap for this uh, release, this webinar. We shall see you uh, next release. And until then, we hope you stay well, stay productive, and we'll see you around. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.